The Virginia Horse Industry Board and the Virginia Christmas Tree Growers Association are proud sponsors of Virginia Farming. This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Large or small, Virginia farmers work year-round to help put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. Today we're meeting in the kitchen with the Virginia Egg Council's Mary Rappaport to get the dish on using eggs during the holidays. Then Mark Viette shows us how to collect seeds when we go in the garden. We'll also have the Ag Calendar, a Minute in the Field video, and of course the Ag News of the Week, all on this edition of Virginia Farming. U.S. pork producers are poised to ramp up production in the coming year, while beef cattle producers have been paring down their herds. Beef cattle numbers in the United States have been declining over the past few years, and herds are currently as small as they've been in more than 10 decades. Next year, it's predicted that U.S. pork production will top U.S. beef production for the first time since the 1950s. The smaller beef herds are a result of high feed prices and high sale prices the farmers were getting for the animals, giving the farmers a good reason to sell cattle they would normally keep as breeding animals to maintain or grow their herds. Now, Also keep in mind that while a pig has two litters a year, a cow will only have one calf a year. Now, the lower the cattle inventory, the higher consumer prices become, but experts believe that rebuilding herds with today's lower feed prices will mean some relief at the meat counters in a couple of years. Virginia tobacco farmers have lived through so many marketing changes in the past 30 years and more changes coming. Tobacco has been a commercial crop in Virginia since 1614. A national tobacco quota system began in 1938 to stabilize farm prices, and it ended in 2004 when the federal government agreed to make transition payments to growers to ease the move to a free market. Almost $200 million in payments have come back to Southside Virginia from those payments, which end in 2014. Virginia's remaining tobacco farmers now sell their crop through contracts with tobacco buyers. The transition payments ended the old system of thousands of smaller tobacco farms scattered across the South. Farmers with the knowledge, the land, and the experience consolidated tobacco acreage and turned to mechanization. Other growers ceased production and used their transition money for other farm enterprises. And others used that money to retire. Smoking has declined in the United States, but tobacco continues to be a valuable export commodity. That means most Virginia growers are likely to survive the end of the transition payments and adapt to new market conditions. Well, right now the market conditions are good for holiday plants. If you enjoy the festive color that hollies and poinsettias bring, you can thank agricultural scientists. The USDA's Bob Ellison has more. A lot of U.S. Department of Agriculture research went into making hollies and poinsettias the plants we know today. You can go into any garden center, any grocery store this time of the year and buy a poinsettia that's relatively inexpensive that you can add instant color and, and holiday cheer to your house that 50 years ago that wasn't even close to being possible. That's because poinsettias are naturally large and branchy. USDA Agricultural Research Service efforts made them smaller, different colored, and on a schedule. Development of new ways to produce the plant that would get them all to come into bloom at once and to stay shorter. And that was work done by Mark Cathy, another ARS researcher. Timing is everything because if they come into bloom on January 1st, it's not really much value. Or if they also come into bloom, you know, in the middle of October, again, doesn't help you much. As for hollies, ARS has a long history with them, like these at the U.S. National Arboretum in the District of Columbia. We had the largest collection of hollies in the United States, a historic collection, and so we were able to educate the nurserymen and uh, homeowners into the diversity that is available in hollies and really broaden the gene pool of what's used in the industry. 
and that gene pool has been broadened so that new holiday varieties burst with color. One of our best introductions is sparkleberry, which is a deciduous holly, which combines traits from a Japanese species and a North American species. And the hybrid has a greater show of fruit, and they're displayed very well in the branches. By the way, Olson says the holly holiday connection predates Christmas, going back to winter solstice celebrations. In Washington, for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, I'm Bob Ellison. Thanks, Bob. Baking for the holidays is in full swing, and you can't bake a lot of those yummy treats without eggs. Today we meet Mary Rappaport in the kitchen to get the dish on eggs. That's straight ahead on Ag Insights. Today we're talking with Mary Rappaport. She's the Consumer Affairs Director with the Virginia Egg Council. Mary, thanks so much for being with us today. I am so glad to be here. Well, I want to give a special thanks to Classic Kitchen and Bath here in Harrisonburg for letting us borrow this gorgeous kitchen. And we are drooling. It's every, beautiful, every isn't it? Every kitchen is more wonderful than the next. It's gorgeous. But today we're here to talk about eggs mm -hmm. and the upcoming holiday season. Mm -hmm. But before we get to the holidays, there's something new going on with eggs. Yeah, well, first of all, I think this is the best time of all for people that enjoy eggs because there's something for everyone. It, it, it's just like, you know how you can get, you used to be able to get any color tissue that you wanted, blue, green, peach, to go with your, your house. Well, anything you want goes for eggs as well. Okay. Um, and we've got a display here that we're gonna show you afterwards, but there are so many wonderful things. If you want eggs that are, 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 are laid by cage-free eggs, uh, hens, you've got it. If you want nutrient-enhanced eggs, they're there for you. If you want eggs that are from happy hens, the ones that have roosters around, and that might have fertile eggs, they're there for you. We have free roaming, we have um, omega-3 in, in, I mean, every, added, a, yes. added to it. And the way they do this is that is by the feed. You have organic eggs. Organic eggs come from chickens that are fed organic food. So there's something for everyone out there and that's kind of really fun. And there's a new thing that has just come to Virginia. I've just started seeing it this year and they're pasteurized eggs in the shell which is so unusual. Wow. Let me grab these. This is a, a carton of them, and um, this is what they look like. They have little peas on them, standing for pasteurized. Pasteurized, uh -huh. and they look like, okay. So my first question is, why bother pasteurizing an egg? Well, you know, I've been with the egg industry for 34 years, and when we first started talking to people, we would make a drink. It was called Instant Egg Pickup. It was delicious a raw egg, orange juice, and honey. Mix it in the blender, drink it. Oh, it felt great. You felt It was a great way to start the day. It used raw eggs. We use raw eggs in so many things, in eggnog, in hollandaise sauce, in homemade mayonnaise, mm -hmm. in loads of pies and pastries that we had. And then we realized that salmonella, every now and then, would make its way inside the egg. And the industry said, okay, no more raw eggs for anybody because we didn't want to put anybody at risk. The, sure. the risk was very slight, but still we felt it was there. It was there and we erred on the side of caution and we threw away all our recipes using raw eggs. And this company, and I believe they're out of Pennsylvania, um, but they came up with a way to pasteurize the eggs in the shell. And um, so how do they do, do you know, how do they do that? They don't tell us exactly the temperature and the time, but it's a heat time it's process. It's a heat, okay. They'll, they'll put them in a water bath in the oven and they bring them to, or a water bath, a hot water bath, to a certain temperature for a certain length of time. You know, when you pasteurize anything, it's all heat. It's a heat process. And in fact, the, the recipes that we use now for things like hollandaise and eggnog and whatnot, you, you do a cooked um, process. Sure. Very low heat for a length of time. And what we tell consumers, as soon as it starts to thicken, that means that it's pasteurized because that's pretty much the coagulation temperature and that is the pasteurization temperature. But what amazes me about that is Every time you cook an egg, and like you say, it starts to get thick, it doesn't take much for that egg, for that egg exactly. white to start turning white exactly. and to start cooking. You can cook an egg in just a matter of a few minutes. A few minutes. So it amazes me they can pasteurize it and still have an egg that comes out. Exactly, and you can, you separate it. Um, I find that it takes a little bit longer to whip the white 
Mm -hmm. That's my only thing about it. it. But if it's in a recipe with other things, it will whip and right. it does work. And it's um, it's perfect for eggnog, for example. Okay. If you're making eggnog at Christmas time and you want to use a recipe that you separate the eggs and you whip up the yolks with the sugar and then you pour the cream in and then you whip up the whites separately and fold that in. And uh, uh, this is a great thing to to use. Now, do you think there's any um, nutritional difference in absolutely these eggs? Not. No, absolutely and not. In fact, that's the interesting thing with most of the different eggs that you buy, the cage-free, the free-roaming, all of those, the only ones that have really any nutritional differences are the ones that have had the additives to it, like the omega-3 we talked about, or extra nutrients and vitamins. And they will say that on the, on the carton. And that's because they have fed the chickens these um, different properties. Okay. Or elements, whatever. Wow. So, well, that's very exciting. Yeah, so now the exciting. egg has egg yeah. exciting. <laughs> so now the egg has even actually just become even more versatile. It's back to where it was when we could use all the raw eggs without yeah. the, the danger. You know, and this is so fascinating. Like I said, I've been with the egg industry for 30 years and I've seen the ups and downs and the ins and outs and whatnot. Egg sales right now, and I know there are a lot of folks out there watching this show that maybe have their own flocks. That's another thing that is like huge. I was in Lowe's the other day and they had all their how-to books. They had a whole slew of books on how to have backyard flocks, mm -hmm. which I think is terrific. There's so many people that are doing that. Um, but the, the nice, nice thing is people have finally realized, again, how nutritious eggs are and what a great place they they really have an important place in our diet let's talk about that nutrition for a minute how much protein is in an egg six grams of protein wow and the but that's misleading okay so there might be six grams in something else in an egg because of the way the nutrient combination the matrix of everything that's in there it the the nutrients in an egg are more bioavailable than other foods for example i eat an egg my body absorbs every single nutrient in there because of the way it's all it's put purity. together. Mm -hmm. I have that same amount of protein in something else. It, it may not absorb anything or just a small amount of it. So that's why we say they're sort of nature's perfect food. Other protein foods are all compared to eggs because of their, their, their perfect protein matrix. Well, something else I want to talk a little bit about today is... You know, in this, the holiday season that we're in, I think we turn a lot of our focus turns turns to people who may need food or who don't have all of the proper nutrition that they need. Mm -hmm. The Egg Council is doing something kind of neat with food banks, are yes, they not? Yes, this is such a fabulous thing. I, I think that any of you who like to give to the needy, and I think we all do in our way, whether it's throwing, you know, a dollar bill at the grocery store when they're ringing bells or you know giving used clothing or whatever we do to help the needy um, the american egg board has a project called the good egg project and they direct you to their website which is incredibleegg.org <laughs> which i think is interesting and, and all spelled out lowercase incredibleegg.org okay and you go to the good egg project you click on that button and it comes up with all this information about what farmers are doing in our country, the kinds of things that they do on their farms, the way um, they are good stewards of our land and the way they handle our hens. And you find out a lot of information there, but also you're given a chance to take a pledge. And the pledge is to do something good every day. What have you done well today? Good today. I mean, I'm sure you did something good. I fed my kids a good there breakfast. There you did. There you go. I hope it had <laughs> But you eat, you um, you do something good every day, and you eat well every day. So um, it, they are encouraging people to eat well. Of course, we'd love you to eat eggs too, and to do something good. And for everyone that takes that pledge, an egg is given to the hungry through food banks. So far, what, what was the statistic? Forty-eight million. It's almost forty-nine million eggs have been given to wow. the hungry and to different food banks all over the the country so that's great and what a great program and specifically for the reason that we just talked about is the nutrition that's in that egg it's yeah. not like giving them you know a box of macaroni and cheese it might not be the most nutritious thing they can get but the nutrition that's found in an egg yeah, is really wonderful protein, all the nutrients the only vitamin it doesn't have they don't have are vitamin c so i say have a glass of orange juice with it you know the other thing is egg sales are up they are up 
six eggs per capita in a year. Wow. The year before that, they were up for the last couple of years. They've been up almost a dozen eggs per capita. That is amazing. And someone said, well, you know, what's that all about? I think all these new diets have something to do with it. Um, they're all pushing uh, low carbs, high protein, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of science behind it. And now that folks are not as fixated on cholesterol, and even the Heart Association is saying that we can enjoy eggs every single day. Right. So, um, you know, I think we still need to concentrate on fat. We don't want to overdose on fat, and we want to get lots of fiber. And I think what's very important is to get a varied diet, but to have that good sources of lean protein throughout the day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, not just at dinner, not just at all through the day, all through the, the day. protein. Yeah. Snacks too. Afternoon snacks, kids come home from school, slice an apple, put peanut butter on it. There you go. Hard boiled egg, another day. Yogurt, another day. Snacks in the afternoon that are... Put it in your salad. Yeah. Put it... You can... Eggs are so exactly. versatile. You can do so much exactly. with them. Yeah. And by the way, if you hear me talking about anything, you can go to our website. I've got tons of recipes on our website. Well, I want to talk a little bit about your recipes. Yeah. I You've got some, some beautiful things some here. Things here. Oh so yeah, with the holidays coming up... Yeah. These are spiced nuts. Ooh. And um, you can use any kind of nuts and really any kind of spice, and it stays on the nuts with an egg wash with eggs okay I have them for meringue nuts using meringue for folks that don't want to have the added fat but you're having nuts so that is fat anyway right um, I have some that use Splenda and they so you're not having the sugar these actually use my trainer my gave me this recipe so these have no added sugar this is I don't have the recipe here but you can go on my website this is for uh, this is the best thing I've ever made in my life I mean, really, because really, you cook a lot. I cook all the time, and I'm saying this because my husband said that. He said, Mary, this is the best thing you've ever made in your life. It's like pecan pie, except with cranberries and cut into little bitty pieces. Ooh. Oh, that's another thing, small bites. That's what the deal is now. Instead of feeling guilty about enjoying all these wonderful sweets during the holidays, cut them in little tiny bites. One bite, that's it, or two bites, that's it. Right. So, so you get to taste it, and yeah. you can move around the table and taste other things, and not feel exactly. guilty with and having you're not to eat invested so much. In a huge slice a of pie, you know, a 500 calorie pot. Yeah, exactly. Right. This is maybe 50 calories each. Oh, these are gorgeous. They are the best, really. Now, tell me where we can find your recipes. You can go to our website, which is www.virginiaeggcouncil.org. Okay. Yeah. And, wow. and then, of course, egg nut. Ah. And I love to serve it in a pitcher like this with a bow That's on it. That's gorgeous. And if you're not having lots of people, this is a great way of doing it. It stays nice and cold. And you can make, if you're making, if you can find the, um, or have a place that you can buy the pasteurized eggs, you, may, you can make it with raw eggs. Otherwise, you can make a wonderful, it's kind of like a cooked custard. It's almost like boiled custard, and it's delicious. Sure. And that's on our website. So, And, you know, I think that's something that I remember my parents and my grandparents having custard and that was always a special treat and that they drank it mm -hmm. and i know my mom still to this day makes custard pies and they're oh, wonderful they're my favorite but i think that's something that we've gotten away from yeah. but now with the pasteurized eggs we can get yeah. back well but you can make them just stirring them slowly again it's a heat process just making sure you don't do don't get impatient because then they right. will, will curl take your time and yeah take okay. your time and do that so anyway lots of ideas on our website please go and check those out okay. and um we're just really happy in the egg industry right now our, our producers are happy and things are going well and um yeah well i think the consumers are happy too because you have given us so many options mm -hmm to fit everybody's individual needs. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, I think that so. our producers have been listening to people and they've given them what they want. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, Mary, thank you for being with us today. Should we toast the holidays I with your so. homemade Let's eggnog? Toast everybody out there and um, let each other. All right. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, Mary. <laughs> we'll be right back. Starting your garden with your own seeds and seedlings saves money. It just takes a little forethought and planning. With tips on collecting seeds, let's join Mark Viette in the garden. Throughout the year, you can collect your own seed right out of your own garden. You can take these seeds and then over the winter or next year, you can germinate them, maybe right in the garden, 
or you can germinate them indoors like you would your vegetables and you can end up with thousands and thousands of plants. And for example here we will take our shears and on your peonies you almost need to harvest them before the peony stems lay open or lay over and you just come in here like this and you need some kind of a tray you keep them upright till you're ready and pretty much you can see all the peony seeds right here ready to be planted in the fall one of my favorite plants to collect seed from is known as wild indigo it used to be used as a dye many years ago they come available in blue this is known as baptisia australis it's the blue wild indigo but now they have white flowered forms yellow flowered forms and they're easy to propagate on your own so all you'll do is when and again you can hear the seed that the seed is definitely ripe and you want to collect this before these little pods begin to break open and they're just beginning to break open so what I like to do is just go through in the garden and by hand gently prune and you might want to prune a couple uh, you know basketfuls or a couple handfuls of this Beckia a black-eyed Susan can be divided in the spring but if I want to produce lots of them I'm gonna harvest the seed and it's easy to do what you're gonna to want to do is first of all look at the flowers and make sure that they're harvested at the correct point in time this here is not quite ready yet on Rudbeckias you want to wait till these petals wither away like what you see here these are perfect to be harvested One of my favorite flowers, hollyhocks, it's a biannual. It grows the first year and then it blooms either later that year or the following year. Easy to just go ahead. This is one you do more by hand and you take the seed pods and then you just sort of like crush the seed pods. You can then blow away the old debris because you really don't want to store the debris. And as you get some of the uh, seed pods with with you know more mature seed they pretty much come out just on their own just like this so you gently use your fingers to remove the seed and then once you're done you can take the seed and store it in Ziploc bags a lot of seed we store in the refrigerator it really depends on what you want to do and then here you have your seed and imagine if you collected all the seed, this would probably be half filled with hollyhocks. Another one that we'll do, that we've harvested, is the baptisia. This one's a little different. Take a paper bag, then you go ahead and you're going to take your seed pods and set them in the paper bag. Not all of them at once, like this. And then you're going to take them and you're going to, and when you're done, you have all your seed ready to be stored. Stick it in the fridge and seed it out in the garden in the spring. Or with many of these seeds, I could scratch them in the surface after November so the seed does not come up till spring and I can fill my garden with all these blooming blues and pinks and purple plants. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. Taking a look at the Ag Calendar, the 2014 Virginia No-Till Alliance Conference will be held February 3rd at the Rockingham County Fairgrounds. There will be an abundance of information with speakers and roundtable discussions. Visit virginianotill.com for registration and information. That does it for our show. Thanks so much for watching and have a great week. I'm Amy Rocher for Virginia Farming.
This program's brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. From apples to zucchini, Virginia farmers work hard to put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org.